impacts above. I'd like to welcome you all to this month's Texas Impact Above Politics uh, webinar. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Texas Impact, uh, we are the state's oldest and largest interfaith network representing the shared social concerns of our member denominations uh, and other faith groups and interfaith groups throughout the state of Texas. We have a team that lobbies on behalf of those mutually agreed upon uh, public policy issues um, at the state level. So we have a team that will lobby at the Capitol and advocate on your behalf in Austin. But we also have a team uh, that includes uh, myself and Ahmad, who's also on the webinar today, uh, who will go out and make presentations to congregations, talk with groups about public policy from a faith perspective, and encourage people of faith to engage in the process. Um, I'm sure it hasn't escaped anybody that uh, we have an election next Tuesday. Uh, I will be going with my uh, wife and nine-year-old daughter to vote this afternoon. Uh, but just as importantly, if just as important, if not more so, is the Texas legislative session is approaching uh, beginning in January. The Texas legislature meets for 140 days every other year, and many of you know or will recognize that health is one of the issues that will be in the forefront. Uh, this next legislative session, because Texas is nearing a point of crisis, both for working Texans and also also for health systems throughout the state. And so today's webinar will focus on health issues and how Texans of faith can get involved in the process. Uh, but we'd also love your feedback. Uh, we've been doing a webinar for the last couple of years now, um, every month focusing on how communities of faith can engage in the public policy process by partnering with state government to implement public policy. And this will be the first of a series of three uh, webinars that will focus on um, health issues in particular and how you and your congregation can get in advocacy. And so we'd love to hear what you think about this webinar and what you'd like to hear in the future. Um, but for now, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so we'll Flip to the first slide, and I'm going to ask a, a question of you to get us started. Um, if you have health insurance, why? Because I'm old. All right. Anybody else? I have it because uh, I'm finding out that I need it. I also have uh, three young adults. And, uh, you know, just getting to the hospital or doctor, it's, a you know, knowing that you have it available is important. But there could be also a problem. The problem is when you have two or three different insurance, then they, the, the uh, insurance companies, the health insurance companies are fighting, well, who's going to be the primary, who's going to be billed? So you get, you get that problem come up. Okay. I have, Anybody because, else? I have it because I um, require a large network of care that uh, the cost would be absolutely prohibited had I not had health insurance. Right. Well, let me ask this. What words come to mind when you think about the possibility of being uninsured? Stress. Mm -hmm. Fear. Anxiety. Anybody else? Benito. <laughs> right. So, so we actually, actually oh, go ahead. We, we actually, actually had that situation a couple of years ago. ago. Sean, are you, Sean, are you hearing me back through the, through the computer now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Can somebody give me a high sign if, if you have me here? All right. So, I can hear in that situation several years mm -hmm. ago, I was working for a nonprofit organization in Huntsville, uh, and we changed insurance providers because of the way our contract uh, was set up. And during that time, my wife and I had our first child. And so, because she was pregnant when we made this switch um, from a group plan to a, uh, a private plan, we stayed on, on COBRA insurance. Uh, to, to help bring us through that pregnancy time period. And my, my daughter uh, was actually born three months premature. 
um, weighing in at two pounds and spent about three months in the hospital. Uh, thankfully, we had um, pretty good insurance to help cover the more than a million dollars worth of bills that came in. Uh, but as soon as the COBRA insurance ran out, uh, we found out that there was no private insurer that would pick her up because they considered her to have a pre-existing condition. And so despite the fact that, you know, I was pretty well educated and had my wife and I both had good jobs, uh, we weren't able to get health insurance for our, at that time, uh, three, four month old baby. So we went the first year or two of her life uh, without her having health insurance. And so when I think about the question, how does it make you feel uh, to be uninsured? Uh, it was terrifying. Uh, you know, we were afraid that she would get sick and we wouldn't be able to afford the bills. And so uh, it was a lot of stress on us as a, a young couple with a newborn. Um, and so the question is, as people of faith, uh, how do we handle the fact that there are so many people within our communities, within our congregations, and, and here in the United States who are facing that stress on a day in and day out basis? And so to give you an overview of today's presentation, um, the next slide will show you um, that we are going to cover um, health insurance in the United States. Just give a quick overview. Uh, we're going to talk about how that compares to uh, health, health insurance in other industrialized countries. And then we'll compare Texas to what's going on uh, here in the United States. And you can see in these slides that uh, Ahmad and our team have put together. Uh, it's probably not an accident that the green is for health insurance in other countries. They do things really well. In the United States and in some other states, uh, yellow. Maybe we do some things well, maybe we could do a little better. Texas is in a bright red box because, as the next slides will show, we actually kind of do a terrible job. And so, quick overview of insurance in the United States in 2015. Uh, you can see that almost half of the people living within the United States, 48%, take advantage of employer-based insurance. So they get health insurance through their job. Uh, another 20% are on Medicaid, meaning that they are uh, extremely low income or disabled. And 14% of the population would be on Medicare, which are folks who are 65 plus. Uh, another 7% would be non-group insurance. Uh, this would be the insurance like I had purchased with, uh, with Emily when we had, had, had changed employers back in the day. Uh, this tends to be uh, more expensive than many of the other plans. 2% uh, would be other, other insurance plans like uh, veterans plans and that kind of thing. And then 9% of the population uh, in the United States in 2015 would be uninsured. Now that, that might seem like a small percentage, um, right at one in 10 Americans not having health insurance. But if you consider how we compare with other industrialized countries, uh, we are way, higher. That 9% that is significantly higher than the 0, 1, or 2% that we find in most other industrialized countries. Um, but if we think about it in terms of our congregation, if 9% of the people that we worship with on Sunday morning or, ex or um, Friday or Saturday uh, were experiencing that stress or, or that, that uncertainty, uh, that's something that we would certainly want to do something about. Uh, and as people of faith, we believe that it is important that we make sure that everybody has access to quality, affordable health insurance. Uh, now we'll flip to the next slide, which shows that despite the fact uh, that we have an extremely high number of people who are uninsured compared to other industrial countries, we're also spending a lot more to do it as a percentage of GDP. We can see that over the, the past decades, mm -hmm. uh, the United States has increasingly spent more and more than the other industrialized countries, and that our rates have been increasing at faster rates. So we're not even getting what we're paying for. And we'll see that in the next slide when we talk about life expectancy. So in this slide, you can see that the United States is spending uh, a significantly higher percentage of our GDP on healthcare, and significantly less on social care. Um, and so as, 
uh, despite the fact that we're spending so much more, our life expectancy is significantly less than other industrialized countries with uh, the average life expectancy in the United States being 78.8 years. Uh, you'll see in these others, um, they're typically in the low to almost mid 80s. And so we're spending a lot more, we're getting a lot less in terms of life expectancy. The next slide will show that it's not only life expectancy where we are getting less than we're paying for. Our infant mortality rate is also significantly higher at 6.1 um, per thousand live births, uh, whereas the other industrialized countries uh, range between 2.4 and 5.2. Um, so what we see in this is that, again, paying a lot more for health care, have a higher uninsured rate, um, but also a lower life expectancy and a higher infant mortality rate. Um, so United States, maybe we could do a little better. Uh, the next slide will show some of the impact of the Affordable Care Act um, in the United States. Uh, you can see in this slide that uh, in the United States as a whole, uh, the uninsured rate during the first year of implementation of the Affordable Care Act went from 13% to 10%. Uh, if we compare that with Texas, uh, the rate in Texas also went down, but we are still the worst in the nation and far behind the national average uh, with our rate during that time going from 20% to 17%. So 17% of Texans uh, were uninsured as of uh, 2014, a rate that is, uh, we would assert is far too high. Um, when it comes up, uh, the next slide, when it goes to, when it comes to the uninsured rate of non-elderly Texans, uh, it's even worse. Um, with that rate going down in Texas from 23% to 20 percent. So uh, right at one in five Texans who are not elderly adults are uninsured. Uh, so the question is, as people of faith, should we care about the fact that one out of every five non-elderly adults in the state of Texas does not have health insurance? Um, there are reasons that we, are, we as a state are doing so poorly, and there are things that we can do about it. And so Ahmad is going to take us through and talk about some of the uh, information related to the Affordable Care Act, and then I'll jump back on to talk about uh, steps that people of faith can, can take uh, to get involved. So Ahmad, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Scott. So the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, um, and you can see a nice picture of it on the next slide. Um, I'm not hearing Ahmad, are you muted still? Hi, uh, I should not be muted. Can you hear me now? I hear you. So, uh, Betsy can hear me. Uh, Scott, can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. So it can, can, and Sean, can you hear me too? Okay. Um, So, uh, Sean, should I keep on going, or can you hear me in, on there? Okay, so the Affordable Care Act, the way that we want to think about the Affordable Care Act is as a, another social insurance program that the United States developed in order to cover a part of the population that did not have access to affordable health insurance. Uh, Scott was talking about some of these other industrialized countries in, in, in Europe, um, that they have these sort of national robust health care programs um, that allows the vast majority of, uh, of its citizens to, to access health care. Uh, in the United States, it didn't really develop the same way. And so we have a lot of these sort of piecemeal programs that develop to cover certain segments of the population. So we had a lot of uh, policies that encourage employer-based insurance and then Medicaid, Medicare in the, in the 60s. Uh, we have to think about the Affordable Care Act as another uh, sort of patchwork uh, cover of a, a segment of society that didn't have access to health insurance um, before in an effort to provide health insurance and therefore um, uh, access to health care uh, for its citizens. So what were some of the changes that happened under the ACA? 
Um, on the next slide, you'll see that, um, you know, people were able to stay on their parents' insurance until the age of 26. Um, the ACA also uh, made uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, it prohibited them from denying policies for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, the ACA also created the marketplace, which uh, uh, increased the access to health insurance. Um, and it also included provisions to promote coverage uh, for small businesses. Um, now, an another really important and one of the most important aspects of the ACA was the expansion of Medicaid. Um, basically, because Medicaid is uh, unlike Medicare, a federal and state partnership, Medicare is a completely federal program. Medicaid uh, for the poor and the disabled is a federal state partnership, which means that the federal government pays a part of the Medicaid costs and the state provides uh, another portion of it, at least 50%. In Texas, that traditional uh, split was the, that the federal government paid 60% of Medicaid and the state uh, pays 40%. As part of the ACA, for those people who, who, who qualify, the federal government would provide 100% um, of the Medicaid cost for the first three years of implementing the program, and after that uh, would, would pay 90%. Um, unfortunately, in 2012, uh, the Supreme Court made that expansion of Medicaid, that aspect of the ACA, optional for states. And there were some states uh, that decided not to expand Medicaid uh, and some states that did. Texas uh, decided not to expand Medicaid, which means that Texas decided not to accept um, the, that federal money. Uh, and for the first three years of it, it would have been completely, there would have been no cost uh, 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 in terms of paying for the actual Medicaid cost. The federal government was going to uh, be responsible for that for the first three years. Um, they decided not to expand. And uh, that decision, that one decision, uh, has left what we call the, the coverage gap in Texas. And that coverage gap uh, it includes about a million people. There's some estimates that uh, go from like 800,000, but are it, the, the number is around a million people in Texas. So um, on the next slide, you'll see a sort of a breakdown on who actually is in, in the coverage gap in Texas. Uh, the blue on this chart are all people who have access to uh, insurance. The ACA was designed uh, so that people who are making between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level um, would have access to health insurance uh, tax credits in the marketplace, which means that they would have subsidies that would make the insurance premiums affordable. Uh, and in theory, the people who were below 100%, who were making less than the federal poverty level, would qualify for Medicaid. And that's sort of like the idea of the ACA. That is, uh, that is founded upon the idea that people who are making less than the federal poverty level would qualify for Medicaid in all of the states. But because that Medicaid expansion was optional, there were some states, like Texas, where people who were making below the federal poverty level because of the very, very strict um, eligibility requirements, they didn't qualify for Medicaid. And so if you look at Texas, um, notice the dark blue for the children. Uh, that means that people who are you know, 18 and below in Texas qualify for Medicaid. Um, it gets a little bit uh, trickier when you go into adults. If you are a, a, an adult and you're below the age of, of 65 and you do not have children, you, there's no way you can qualify for Medicaid. That orange part in the very top uh, 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 bar, there's, there's no blue because you do not qualify for, for Medicaid uh, if you do not have kids. If you do have kids, uh, the eligibility requirements are very, very strict. Um, and actually, if you have, I'm sorry, is that a question? Uh, so if you do have kids, let's say if you have a family of three, uh, your, your children qualify 
or Medicaid because in Texas, you're, you know, the children have access to Medicaid, but the parents need to make uh, below $3,600 a year uh, in order to qualify for Medicaid. If you make more than that, if you make more than $3,600 a year, the, 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 the household income is above 3,600, then you don't qualify for Medicaid. And if you make less than the federal poverty level for a family of three, then you don't qualify for the uh, health insurance marketplace subsidies. And you're caught in this, this area of, of health insurance, the coverage gap, where you're making uh, too much money to qualify for Medicaid and you're making not enough money to qualify for the subsidies. And so what you're stuck with, uh, and we can see on the next slide who, who is actually stuck, um, you're stuck with insurance premiums that are far too expensive uh, if, you're, if you're making less than the poverty level. And uh, this umbrella sort of shows the difference between states that did expand Medicaid and states that didn't. In states that did expand Medicaid, you have this nice full umbrella that uh, covers uh, all of these uh, people. You see the elderly and the people with disabilities, children, um, pregnant women, and adults in a, in a fully, and adults who are making a, a certain amount of money who are covered with Medicaid. In Texas, we kind of chopped off that last third of people. And so adults and only a very small percentage of, of parents who are making a very, very tiny amount of money uh, 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 qualify for Medicaid. And so we have a, a large number of people, and in Texas it turns out to be about a million people uh, who don't have access to health insurance. Um, now, if we go on to the next slide, we'll see how that looks for an individual family, and we'll see that for a family of, of four, just making $500 a year, uh, I'm sorry, just making a, a very uh, $1,500 a year more uh, than another family can put you in a completely different mindset. We were talking earlier about what having insurance means and how it feels, the stress, the debt, the decisions. Uh, um, that people need to make between paying for necessity. Um, if you make less than the federal poverty level, then you don't qualify for the subsidies. You also don't qualify for Medicaid. You're stuck with insurance premiums that are, you know, 400 and hundreds of dollars per month, which is just not affordable. And if you make just a little bit more money, uh, you do qualify for those. And because you qualify for the subsidies and you're making not a lot of money, you uh, your subsidies are, are pretty large and you get a very, very significant in your premiums. Um, and so $43 a month is, is, is affordable. Um, and, and that's kind of what that decision, that, that decision that the legislature made uh, uh, in 2012 has created this, uh, this gap. And the eligibility requirements are very, very strict. Um, and it's, and it's really, it, it creates this, uh, a scenario where it's, it's really a little bit unfair because the people who are making $23,000, $500 a year is, are not working any less hard than those others. But because of this, uh, this decision, there's that huge difference in insurance and that, uh, has huge implications, uh, on their access to healthcare. Um, there's on the on the next slide we'll see that there's a there's a, a market difference in states and the citizens in the states that have uh, expanded Medicaid. Um, this is a Harvard study that compared Arkansas and Kentucky to expansion states to Texas, and it showed that because people had access to health care through the expansion of Medicaid and through these marketplace subsidies, uh, that they were more likely to have a personal physician. They were less likely to have a cost-related delay in care. They were less likely to skip medication because of cost. Uh, they had less trouble paying medical bills. And they were more likely to have a checkup in the past year. So there are definite health benefits. The people in, in, in who have access to health insurance are more likely to have better health care and therefore better health outcomes. Um, and, you know, it, because Texas is, is such a large state, on the, on the next slide we'll see which states decided to expand and which states didn't. 
And uh, can anybody tell me, I know you all you're on mute right now, but uh, if we look at the, the map, we'll see that a lot of the states that decided not to expand the orange ones are in the South, uh, conservative states or low population states in the Midwest. Um, and, and Texas, by virtue of being the second most populous state, the second largest in land mass, that decision uh, is very different from a decision, let's say in Maine, to not expand Medicaid because the decision not to expand coverage across the country uh, affected about uh, 3 million people. There's about 3 million people who fall in this coverage gap uh, from states that didn't decide to expand Medicaid. In Texas, we hold 1 million of those. So a third of all the people in the entire country that don't have access to health insurance because their state decided not to expand Medicaid, a third of them are housed in Texas. So Texas, just by being Texas, is very influential and also affects more people um, than other states. And uh, Scott's going to tell you about uh, the, what, what, what people of faith and what you can do uh, about uh, all these things that we've been learning about today. That's right. And Sean also just wanted me to mention that he has muted uh, folks on the call uh, and will unmute that uh, for the Q&A time so folks can jump back in. Uh, but I want to tell a story about a recent convert who uh, was visiting some leaders of faith, uh, hanging out around a river uh, not long ago. And, and he was standing, standing there and he saw this, this baby floating down the river in a basket. And so uh, the people of faith ran into the river and, and pulled the basket out, and everybody celebrated that they had pulled this, this baby out of the river. And then a few hours later, another baby came floating down the river in a basket, and again, these, these leaders of faith went out into the river and, and pulled the baby out. And this happened over the course of a couple of days, several times, until finally the recent convert said, hey, at some point, shouldn't we maybe go run up the river and figure out why these babies keep getting thrown into the river? Maybe we should address this problem in a systematic way instead of continually responding to needs as they come in front of us. And I feel like as congregations, far too often we do that. Uh, we have people in our congregations who are financially strapped. We have people in our congregations who are without health insurance. And so we help, help take care of them when that time comes. But at some point, we need to ask the larger systematic question, the larger issue of justice of how do we address a system that allows one out of every five uh, non-elderly adults uh, to go without health insurance? And in Texas, we can do something about that by making decisions about um, solutions to uh, some of these holes in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if we'll flip to the next, next slide, the next couple of slides talk about the fact that as people of faith, we recognize the imperative of caring for our neighbor. Uh, from the, the, the Jewish tradition, uh, we have scripture that says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What is hurtful to yourself, do uh, not do to your fellow man. That is the whole of the Torah and the remainder is but commentary. From Christianity, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this is the law of the prophets. From Islam, no one is a believer until he loves for his neighbor and for his brother what he loves for himself. From Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and regard your neighbor's loss as your own loss, even as though you were in their place. From Hinduism, a man obtains a proper rule of action by looking on his neighbor as himself. Uh, as people of faith from a number of different traditions, we recognize that caring for our neighbor is an important part of our calling as people of faith, and yet here in the state of Texas, our neighbors are being left behind. And so it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to figure out where we fit in the policy uh, process, what levers can we pull, which gears can we move in order to make a difference? And so that's a question we each need to ask of ourselves. Uh, what does our time allow for us? How can we influence the process? 
uh, maybe there are times in our lives where we are a small gear, where we can make a difference by showing up to vote, uh, especially in the primary elections here in Texas. Uh, we can, as an individual, go have a conversation with our legislator. But sometimes we might be able to tap into parts of our lives that might allow us to be a larger gear. Uh, maybe we uh, have a Sunday school class or a small group or a congregation that would be willing to engage in the process uh, by scheduling a day to go visit with their legislator. Maybe I have a friend or a relative who is in leadership at a hospital or university uh, that might be able to call upon their legislator uh, to make a difference. Maybe I am related to somebody or our friends with a um, local elected official uh, who uh, might be able to make a difference. What areas of influence do we have in our lives where we might be able to influence the policy process and what are we willing and able to do about it? So I want to go through a couple of different tools that Texas Impact has available for you to either learn about or influence the public policy process. Uh, the first that I want to highlight today is the Texas Impact Treasure Hunt. Uh, some of you who are on the webinar today might have uh, participated in this thus far. If not, I would encourage you to consider it. Uh, the Treasure Hunt is a publication that Texas Impact has put out. Uh, it's online. Um, search for Texas Impact Treasure Hunt and it should pop right up. Uh, but there are 12 different hands-on activities excuse me, where people can learn about public policy and how it's lived out in your local community. And so uh, one of the hands-on projects might be for you to go visit a low-income school and visit with the school counselor or the school principal about what challenges are facing uh, that community. Uh, so 12 different hands-on activities to help you learn about how folks uh, in your community uh, interact with public policy on a daily basis. We have found that several congregations have done this uh, as in, in a number of different ways, uh, maybe as a Sunday school class. There was one congregation who did it as a joint project between their youth group and senior adults. So they go do a hands-on project and come back and talk about it. This is important for a couple of, of reasons. Uh, first, your congregation gets to know your community a little better. Second, at the end of each session, we ask you to write up your reflections and what you learned and send it, send it to us. Uh, this is a good way for you to learn about your community, but also for Texas Impact staff uh, to learn about what's happening throughout the state so we have stories to tell uh, to legislators when they ask. It also helps prepare you uh, to know about your community in a way that would allow you to talk to your legislator about concerns um, that you found from a firsthand perspective. Uh, legislators are always interested in, in hearing stories from local people of faith who said, who were able to say, we visit our local school and here's what we found and here's what we think and here's what you can do about it. Uh, much better to have actual stories than just, um, you know, uh, opinions. Uh, the next thing I want to highlight is something that's coming up here in the next couple of weeks, um, but you can actually do it in, in whatever way works for your local congregation. The Health Justice Sabbath. Uh, this is an effort by Texas Impact and a number of other organizations uh, to spend a weekend, uh, prefer preferably the weekend of November 18th through 20th, but again, whatever weekend works for you, uh, to talk about health justice, to pray about health justice, and or to do something about health justice in your local congregation. We have a website abovepoliticstx.org, where Texas Impact staff have prepared a number of different resources that are available to your congregation. There are uh, prayers, there are liturgies, there are sermon starters, there is uh, a wealth of information about health in the state of Texas. And our hope is that hundreds of congregations would spend some time the weekend of November 18th through 20th or a time that works for you, talking about issues of health. Uh, full disclosure, uh, post Health Justice Sabbath, we will be uh, sharing with legislators that the X number of congregations talked about health on that particular weekend. Uh, and I've been really inspired with hearing the stories of what congregations are doing. We have a number of clergy who will be preaching sermons about health 
our health justice that weekend. We have a number of congregations that will do special prayers of the people uh, for people who are sick in Texas. Uh, we have a, a rural congregation in East Texas who is uh, doing a health fair that weekend. We have a congregation in South Texas that's doing a blood drive after church on Sunday. Um, Betsy's on the call today, one of our, our board members, uh, University United Methodist Church of Austin will be hosting an advocacy training in January and inviting other congregations to participate. Uh, so we're asking your congregation to think about what makes sense for you, uh, what you're able to do to talk about um, or do related to health or health justice on that, that weekend or a time that works for you. On the abovepoliticstx.org website, you can register your congregation. There's an interactive map that shows the congregations that are signed up. Uh, so you can find one near you. Uh, we will be promoting it for the next couple of weeks and encouraging people to find a congregation uh, on the map and go participate in what they have going on. So we would encourage you to get your congregation added soon uh, so that people can come visit and participate with you. Um, the next slide um, talks about the importance of making district visits. After your Health Justice Sabbath experience or after you um, do the treasure hunt, we would encourage you in these next few weeks before the legislature convenes at uh, the beginning of January to schedule a time where either you or a group of people from your congregation could go visit with your legislator or their staff in their district office about uh, the importance of addressing health the importance of finding a solution at the state level to make sure those million people that Ahmad mentioned get access to coverage. Um, we've had uh, a handful of Texas Impact board members and staff who've been making, or not staff, uh, volunteers throughout the state who've been making these district visits. Many of them have asked for uh, help or training on how to make a successful district visit. And so we've organized webinars or conference calls uh, with people before they go make their district visit about how to make that as successful as possible. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to do a training on uh, specifically how you can do a successful district visit. Uh, but the bottom line is, um, these legislators and their staff, uh, I really do believe this, uh, are doing this for the right reason. Uh, they care about Texas, they care about people in their district, uh, and they want to hear from you. Uh, a lot of people, when they go make their first district visit, are nervous. They think that uh, legislators are, uh, you know, above human in some way. But the important thing to remember is that uh, these are folks who come from your communities. These are people who uh, likely shop at the same grocery stores that, that you sh shop at. Uh, their kids probably went to the same schools uh, that our kids go to. Um, and they, they probably go to a congregation similar to yours. They're, they're real people who are looking for uh, advice and, uh, and comments from people in the district. And so we'd encourage you to go, to go visit them. Uh, one United Methodist Women's Group decided that they were gonna bring pie uh, to their legislator and the people who are working in that office. So figure out a way that you can let them know that you're there, uh, you're available if they, they need input, that you'll be praying for them as they go throughout the legislative session and that you have an opinion on health care in the state of Texas. And encourage them to, to try to find a solution for those one million folks who could really use access to care. Um, other opportunities Texas Impact has going on during the legislative session, we tried this out as a pilot last session and are going to ramp it up even bigger and better this legislative session. Uh, last legislative session, Texas Impact rolled out what we called Clergy Mondays. About halfway through the session, we decided, we had a couple board members who said, we should start having clergy get together every Monday at the Capitol. Um, and it started growing and expanding. This legislative session, we're calling it Weekly Witness. Every Monday during session at noon, Texas Impact staff will have a room reserved at the Capitol where groups or individuals can show up to learn about an issue of the week from our Texas Impact legislative agenda. So we'll highlight one issue every week during the session, but we'll also have our general counsel and director of government affairs, Josh Houston, will provide a weekly update on what's hot at the Capitol that week. What on our legislative agenda is moving forward needs support, or what legislation is moving that is in opposition to our legislative agenda that um, Texas Impact would be interested in killing. 
And so we'll have a weekly update on what's going on at Capitol at noon. Uh, we're also hoping to make that available online and by telephone. And so just go ahead and save every Monday uh, at noon during the legislative session for a weekly update. And then we'll, we'll have some action steps people can take. Uh, we will have legislators, a list of legislators and issues that people who are in the Capitol can go visit. We'll have a telephone call list uh, for people who call in or join by webinar where you can make some telephone calls to legislators on issues that are important uh, to people of faith in Texas. So we recognize that most people can't visit the Capitol every Monday during session. We had one board member who did that last time. Uh, but we, we are encouraging groups to consider picking a Monday that you can organize a group to come down. We have one bishop who's talking about maybe organizing a bus to bring clergy down one Monday. Uh, we have another congregation who's talking about scheduling um, an advocacy day for people of their congregation to come to the Capitol. So just know that we'll be there every Monday at noon, and we would encourage you to consider bringing a group of people of faith at least one Monday during the session. Uh, soon we will have a place where your group can RSVP uh, to attend one of those days. Uh, if you bring a big enough group, we'd be happy to work with you on the issues that you would want us to cover during that session. So weekly witness on Mondays. Uh, other opportunities to get involved. Um, on the next slide, talk about lobby days. Uh, Texas Impact is in a number of coalitions uh, that will be sponsoring uh, various lobby days. Uh, if you're not on our email list or follow our social media, Facebook and Twitter, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, so you can be uh, up to date on all the different opportunities to get involved. But a couple that I'll, I'll highlight today. Um, one of my favorite weeks every year is when the United Methodist Women come to Austin. Uh, oftentimes there are more than 200, almost 250 United Methodist Women for, from throughout the state will come to Austin for two days of legislative training. After the second day, they'll come up with their own legislative agenda. And then on the third day, um, those 200, 250 United Methodist women will trek over to the Capitol in buses and go visit their legislator on the issues that they came up with uh, as priorities. The United Methodist Women's Legislative Event this year is January 22nd through 24th. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Lutherans decided to model their own event after the United Methodist Women. So we have a Lutheran legislative event February 12th through 14th. Uh, we'd encourage folks to uh, register for either one of those. You can find information at texasimpact.org as it becomes available. Uh, Cover Texas Now, the coalition that's working on uh, coverage expansion in the state of Texas is having a lobby day on March 6th. So you can go and add that to your calendar if healthcare is of interest to you. Uh, and that will be an exciting day. Uh, and then the Texas Impact Board Lobby Day is April 20th. And I believe that might be something that will be opened up to Texas Impact members throughout the state. But again, keep an eye on texasimpact.org um, and our social media for updates on upcoming lobby days. Um, a really exciting opportunity uh, that Texas Impact has been doing for decades is a service of public witness. On the first day of the legislative session, um, which is January 10th, Tuesday, January 10th. That morning before the legislature convenes, Texas Impact uh, will be doing an interfaith service of public witness, uh, weather permitting, uh, like you see on, in the picture here, on the steps of the Capitol, where people from various traditions will pray for the legislature that's about to convene. Last time we tried something kind of spur of the moment a couple of weeks before the event, uh, we decided to encourage people to consider hosting a prayer meetup in their own community. Uh, and because of the hard work of Sean Hennigan and some other Texas Impact volunteers, uh, we, uh, they were able to turn around a video from the morning uh, interfaith prayer service at the Capitol and make it available to prayer meetup sites throughout the state. Uh, two years ago, uh, we had uh, about 500 people participate in those prayer meetups. This time we would love for uh, that number to be significantly higher. So we'd love to encourage your congregation or group, some people did it in their home, to uh, host a prayer meetup. We will uh, make a lot of resources available 
uh, including the video from the morning, but also the Texas Impact Legislative Agenda and a, a lot of other things that you can distribute uh, as you see fit in your prayer meetup location. We do have a place to sign up for the prayer meetups um, online. Uh, once people start signing up, we'll have a map uh, of, of locations throughout the state if you'd like to make your, your location a, a place where other people could come. And so uh, I hope that y'all will consider participating either at the Capitol or by hosting a prayer meetup in your local community. Um, and last but not least, uh, Texas Impact is a membership organization. Uh, we have member denominations, member congregations, and individual members uh, who support the work of Texas Impact. Uh, we have people who are working on your behalf in the Capitol uh, throughout the year, and if you'd like to support that work, our ind individual memberships, um, I believe, start at $40, and our uh, memberships for congregations and Sunday school classes and so forth, uh, affinity groups, uh, start, I believe, at $100. Uh, you can find uh, ways to become a member, again, at texasimpact.org. So uh, I believe we're going to open it up now for Q&A, but, but um, as folks are being unmuted, I just say that, that Ahmad and I, other members of our team, are, are willing and able and excited to go out and do this presentation or others uh, for members throughout the state. Uh, we have some areas where we're especially trying to do presentations and encourage people to make district visits. If that's of interest to you, uh, my email address is scott at texasimpact.org. I see people writing, so I'll say it again. Scott, S-C-O-T-T. At texasimpact.org. Uh, we would love to visit with you about uh, how we can get folks in your local community involved in this issue. Uh, we'd also love for all of you to sign up for Health Justice Sabbath and add your congregation and, and your name to the list of, of people who are interested in this issue and doing something about it. I guess we didn't have a slide. We also have an individual statement that I know many of you have signed uh, calling on the legislature to act. Uh, we'll email that out to people um, after the call, and uh, we have a sign-in sheet where you can distribute it around to small groups or, or other groups in your community to have them sign on. Uh, our goal is to have you know, hundreds if not thousands of people signing this interface statement for coverage expansion throughout Texas. Uh, so I'll stop talking um, and see if anybody on the call has any questions. Uh, this is Betsy. I have some questions. Go for it. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm going to be visiting Senator Campbell's office next week, and I'm wondering um, if you have any uh, leave behind um, for her staff. A kind of a summary of what you've been saying to us. We can. Um, Betsy, I'll... I'll follow up with you on email by that. So leave behinds for Senator Campbell. Okay. Another question. Um, earlier on, you were talking about the crisis that Texas faces because of the uh, changes in the Affordable Care Act, uh, where counties won't be getting reimbursed, hospitals won't be getting reimbursed. Are you not emphasizing that aspect anymore? Ma, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, that's that, that's a part of it. Uh, I think that there's there's a lot of aspects of um, of not expanding coverage and how it's going to affect um, Texans. Uh, there is definitely the uh, you know the property tax aspect of it and half hospitals uh, losing money. Um, I don't want to say that it's not a part of it. We didn't talk about it in this presentation, um, but. Uh, that's 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 definitely an aspect of the problem. It's what? It's 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 an aspect. It's it's one of the consequences of of non expansion. Uh, that wasn't we were. Uh, yeah. It's not that we're not well, talking. You, just in this you know, when you first presented that, um, I thought that was a really good approach with the legislators, since the budget is probably going to have problems. But mm -hmm. people that I. <clears throat> no one respect that the legislature say that there's really no way that health care is going to come up with this legislative session and I um, I don't understand how they can just ignore the financial aspects uh, Texans the Texas legislature seems to be pretty willing to just 
you know, to ignore health, but <laughs> they don't usually ignore finances. Right. And again, Betsy, talking about those gears um, from earlier, uh, one of the things that I know groups are working on, uh, and I'd encourage us to think about, is who we know in, so when we think about lobbying, we oftentimes just think about visiting with our legislator. Uh, but one of the important things to think about uh, is uh, who we know within hospital systems, who we know within local government, who we know in county government, and who we know in local universities that we can talk to uh, and encourage them uh, to have meetings with their legislators. Because it's one thing for you know, me and my Sunday school class to go visit my state rep. Uh, it's another uh, for the CEO of the local hospital to go have that conversation. And so uh -huh. I think we're encouraging folks to think about who are the decision makers, who are the key players in your local community, and can, what, what are your connections with them, and how can you encourage them to go have the same conversations that we'll be having. Okay. All right. Um, okay. That's all my questions. We'll get something over to you, Betsy Young, for Senator Campbell. Uh, any okay, other questions? Thanks. You said that the legislative sessions start on January 10th. How long do those go for? 140 days every other year, unless there's a called special session. So this time it goes January 10th through Memorial Day. I guess I should say we're not going to have a weekly witness on Memorial Day because it'll be over then. That was an easy one, Megan. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Perhaps this is something that um, that Imad and, and you and I can follow up on, but I was just wondering, so this was the presentation that you would give to an interfaith group, which is this group who's assembled today. I'm just curious how that would look different if, uh, so I work on a college campus, uh, how that presentation might look different for college students. I know you said that, uh, Imad, last week you went to UTD, or maybe it was two weeks ago. Um, that um, just wondering how that presentation might be different and tweaked for empowering college students to get active. Yeah, so there's uh, more of a focus on how uh, the non-expansion affects young people. Um, and uh, also in terms of the advocacy, uh, it's not, it's focused more on uh, coalition building in the university and who are, um, the other gears that you can influence as being a student. In terms of the information, it's, it, it's pretty much the same in terms of uh, the data, um, but it's in the advocacy and the focus on how it affects uh, individuals is where the difference is. Yeah, so for example, we have a lot of students who aren't from Williamson County or Travis mm -hmm. County. Um, and so how, I mean, it seems like it would be a, stretch to ask them to go visit their local representatives if they're from Houston or McAllen or wherever they're from. Right. So there's um, having an in-district visit um, and, you know, and then there's also visiting that legislator, uh, you know, in Austin and advocacy day. That's something if they're in, 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 in town is something that we're stressing is coming down for advocacy day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also reaching out to their communities back back home. So um, not, they're a student at, you know, in Georgetown or Austin, um, but they also still probably have connections um, back home. So spreading the message, seeing if there's anybody at a university or college campus in that area that would want to host that so that people on the ground over there would want to do a legislative visit. Um, so there's uh, that, that, that slide that Scott was talking about in terms of who do you know and how do you utilize your network? That's, yeah. that's kind of what we talk about. Okay, cool. Thank Especially you. if you're not from the area that uh, the university's in. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll also say we were in a, a conversation with, actually with the Episcopal Health Foundation uh, not long ago, and there's, there's a group of uh, Latino congregations um, who have gotten really invested and involved in, in health justice issues uh, and advocacy and voter registration and that kind of thing in the past year because their young co their college students came home this summer and 
kind of lit up the local congregations about needing to do more. And so I guess encouraging folks when they go home on break to encourage their, their home congregations to get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody What's your up? Twitter handle? Um, our Texas Impact one? Yeah, is it at Texas Impact? Is it TX Impact, Sean? I'm looking right now. Yeah, I think Sean sent that out on the, on the chat. Okay, cool, thanks. There, yeah, Sean just put it on the chat. At TX Impact, okay. And this would be a good time to highlight uh, I think Texas Impact was recognized a few years ago. This is before I got there, so I'm not taking credit for it. Got some award for social media interaction during a session. Sean does a ton of tweeting during session, including uh, a lot on our Ledge TV channel, which has a lot of different videos of what's going on during the day. So those are both two great resources to, to keep an eye on. And if I said any of that wrong, Sean will edit it out before he posts the webinar. He loves it when we say that. Um, any other questions? Did I hear somebody there? Is there somebody coming into Megan's office? Yeah. All right. Well, if there are no other questions today, uh, again, we would encourage you to keep an eye on TexasImpact.org. We would encourage you to follow us on Twitter and uh, Facebook, which was just mentioned. Uh, but more, feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. We'd love to visit with you about uh, how we can interact with people in your community, how we can interact with your congregation, um, and we would love to get creative about that. Uh, we're happy, um, you know, we can webinar in just about any time, but, uh, you know, if we you can pull a group of congregations together or something in your local community. We'd love to come visit. Uh, we'd especially love to have conversations in the next couple of months leading up to session about health or health justice. Again, you can always catch me at scott at texasimpact.org. Um, and my cell phone number, I will type into the chat right now, 281-728-4593. Uh, um, give me a call and we can try to get something up or I'll connect you with the appropriate person, whether it be a mod or somebody else on our team. Um, again, I mentioned at the beginning, we are in conversation about what we'll be doing with these webinars in the future. Uh, so we'd love your feedback and love to know what would be beneficial to you. If there's nothing else, um, until next time, I thank you for your work in your communities uh, and your faithful ministry. Uh, so thanks again for everything. Bye. Thanks. Bye, thanks, thanks a lot.